Looks good. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Martin. I'm very happy to be presenting this evening as an ASE member. Some of you may know that Mark introduced me to the ASE. You might even know that we worked together for a number of years around the turn of the century. <laughs> <laughs> We're obviously not as old as that makes us sound, and it's not particularly relevant, but it is how it will be referred to in the history books. They first worked together at the turn of the century, developing software for manufacturing. You get the picture. Yep. So Mark and I have a few things in common. Astronomy is obviously one. An interest in technology is another. And we both love a challenge. And that is of relevance this evening. So when you get an opportunity which ticks all three boxes, a technical challenge involving astronomy, you grab it with both hands. And I hope you'll enjoy hearing the full story this evening. So what's this evening all about? Well, hopefully it will be a geeky, techy talk, which is neither too geeky nor too techy. Uh, I did wonder whether it might be suitable for this audience but then I remembered you're all rocket scientists and particle physicists now. So a little chat about software and JavaScript will be a walk in the park. So on the menu tonight, we have a software starter, a meaty astronomy main course, and then a tasty dessert, which combines both topics. I'll be demoing things throughout without the aid of a safety net. So we can all expect the unexpected. I did wonder about introducing an element of audience participation, but I decided against that in the end. I've seen and heard you all in action and you're not to be trusted. <laughs> However, if you do behave, there might be time at the end for the usual Q&A. Uh, you can try to interrupt any time if you can get a word in, because once I get started, there's usually no stopping me. Um, but do resort to using the chat window and hopefully Peter will pick up any questions for us along the way. So in our modern world, software is ubiquitous and we're almost at the point of taking it and the hardware it runs on for granted. And it's no different in astronomy and astrophotography. And you may remember that Horst first featured software and astronomy during his talk last month. So as astronomers and astrophotographers, we use software for a number of things. Um, first of all, as we've just been discussing, we use it to figure out whether it's worth getting our gear out, taking advantage of mainstream services like news and weather and so on. Secondly, we might use it to access specialist services like ISS flyover information, or perhaps some of the NASA mission apps, the New Horizons mission, which launched in 2006 and finally reached Pluto in 2015, had a feature rich application for mobile phones, which gave all manner of info about, about the mission. We also use software to control and guide our telescopes and control our cameras and capture still and video images. And then, of course, we use it to pre-process, process, and post-processes, post-process those images and videos. And we've all seen this at close quarters during the intro to astro imaging sessions, which have been hosted by Mark and Andrew. And finally, of course, we use it to make sessions like this possible. And when I say that software and astronomy related software in particular is everywhere, that is literally the case. Many of us will use software on multiple machines at home. We we'll use content online or cloud-based services for some purposes. And you've probably got a pocket full of apps on your person, even as I speak. You might even be using such a mobile device to view this very session. And many software applications that we use are available on multiple platforms so that you can use the same tools at home and on the move. And then furthermore, in some special cases, 
we have software products bundled with specific hardware, creating an appliance that's designed for a specific purpose. And that could be a telescope guiding package or a dedicated EAA device capable of capturing, stacking and processing images on the fly, as Andrew demonstrated recently. Now this technology availability is a fantastic thing and needs to be celebrated. It means that we have information at our fingertips with immediate access to answer almost every question, although not during ASE quizzes. The main question we haven't answered yet though is exactly when Betelgeuse will go supernova. The specific software that's the core subject of the talk tonight is a case in point. It's available online, on my laptop and on my phone. And I can use it to view the cosmos in space and time from a variety of observer locations, zooming in and out to explore using my fingertips. And this offers a much more immersive experience than with just a book, even a book that contains lots of amazing Hubble images. So Stellarium is described as being planetarium software, but that doesn't make it unique. There are several other examples of this type of software which run on the platforms I described earlier. And tonight I've got no intention of getting into a religious debate about which planetarium software is best. That type of discussion needs an old school environment, a pub with beers and nibbles before we can get started. Every one of you listening will have your own personal favourites, I'm sure. However, I did notice that Stellarium even made a very brief cameo appearance in A Residence in the Clouds, which we watched together recently. Uh, I never met him to ask, of course, but I reckon Charles Piazzi Smythe would have been impressed with it. He would have loved one specific feature and see if you can spot that as we go through the rest of the evening. Stellarium is important because of a facility that it offers, which does set it apart from some other planetarium software products. Uh, therefore, whilst tonight's not really about demonstrating Stellarium, it does make sense to show you some of the features that I'll rely on later. So I've already got Stellarium running, so I'll switch over to it now and we'll look at a few things together. So this is the main page of Stellarium. And as you can see, we're looking at a bright blue sky. So it's clearly not pointing out of my window. Um, along the bottom, we've got some controls here that I'm going to introduce. Uh, if I get lost, I can turn on my constellation lines and I can also turn on the labels so I know exactly what I'm looking at. Doesn't really help us do much in the way of observing right now. So I can turn some other things off. I can turn off the ground and I can hide the atmosphere. So now we've got a much better view of the, of the night sky. Neil, can I just ask, is it possible just to lift the screen slightly? In what way, sorry? I can't see the bottom. Um, uh, the bottom. Top. Right, I okay. I can see it fine. It then it's just me. It looks fine to me as well, yeah. It's, it's just a strange aspect ratio, but yeah, it's fine. If you clear any okay. of the chat things at the bottom that are sitting waiting, it'll move the toolbar down for you. I've had to do that. So you've probably got a number against the chat box. If you go in and clear that, it should allow the toolbar at the bottom to disappear. I know it's all about this software. It's, uh, yeah. I've just got the, the Zoom. It's fine, Hold it's on. fine. Yeah. Carry on, please. Okay, thank you. Down here, I've also got the field of view indicator that tells me what my field of view is, and I can zoom in and out, and you can see that adjusting. I've also got my time controls, so I can stop time and uh, restart it again, and go back to the current time. And I can navigate backwards and forwards in time. Over on this side, I've got some other controls that I can use to interact. There's a search window, for instance, that allows me to find objects by name. So I can do 
a quick search for something like the moon. Now, no Friday night session would be complete without an Iridium flare reference. So what can <laughs> Stellarium do for us here? Stellarium has access to a number of what are called plugins. Um, and one of those is a sat satellite plugin that I can use to have a look for some Iridium flares. You're only encouraging him, Neil. <laughs> I know, I, f I felt like it deserved a reference. <laughs> So I'm just going to I'm just going to fill for a second while Stellarium tries to find some iridium flares for us to look for, and hopefully it won't take too much longer. This is the only bit that I couldn't pre-prepare, so I'm just hoping that it will respond. There we are, and so I can click on one of these, and hey presto, we've got. Iridium 5, and it will tell us a bit of information about it. You can see that it's moving by the coordinates. It's non-operational, um, but it's visible. So there we go. That's our tip of the hat to the Iridium flares. So we can see how valuable a tool like Stellarium could be for newbies and experienced astronomers alike. So now let's turn our attention to the next part of the story. If you're familiar with the ASE's objectives and our website, and I hope you are on both fronts, then you'll know that our constitution mentions advancing the education of the public on the science of astronomy in the very first sentence. And we have two programs which play a part here. The first is Four Steps to the Stars, and the second is the one that we're gonna focus on this evening, which is the ASC 24 Observing List for Beginners. The Four Steps program covers choosing and using equipment and getting started with observing and imaging. Whilst the ASC 24 Observing List for Beginners is all about directing new budding astronomers to objects of interest. So we'll do a, a short recap on the ASC 24 for anyone who's not fully acquainted with it. So it's named, first of all, to match our birthday, or it might simply be named that way because it contains 24 objects. I don't really know. Either way, there are a great selection of objects within reach for new astronomers with modest equipment. And it's split into six parts. It covers the moon, double stars, planets, nebula and galaxies, globular clusters and open clusters. So there really is something for everyone. And thanks to Andrew's quiz questions last week, we should all now know what the first item on the list is. And a wrap on the knuckles if you don't. So how do we start bringing these two component topics together? Well, as I said earlier, I do love a challenge. And Mark had dropped a short comment into an online discussion about Stellarium scripting, um, thereby tossing down the gauntlet. And because I love a challenge, I, of course, picked it up. So consider the things that we did interactively in the previous short demonstration, adjusting the view settings, the date and time window, searching and modifying the field of view. What if we could do things like that by writing instructions? And it turns out that we can do that by writing instructions in a programming language called JavaScript, which is one of the main building blocks of modern website content. And we can use JavaScript to interact with Stellarium through its programming interface or API. So again, let's switch over to Stellarium and see what we can do here. Now, I did say that I would do a live demo without the aid of a safety net. Um, but I'm not completely mad. I'm not going to write code live in front of you. I've, I do have some code uh, snippets that I prepared earlier in, uh, in true Blue Peter fashion. So let's see what we can do when we drop some script code into the Stellarium script window. 
So I'm just going to park this at the bottom of the screen um, because actually seeing the script right now isn't that important. So anyone who's done any software development of any kind before will know that the first thing that you must write when learning a new environment or language is the Hello World program. But I decided that wasn't big enough for what we're doing right now, so I added a little twist. So that's the first thing we can do. We can put some labels up onto the screen. Second thing we want to be able to do is we want to be able to modify some of the, the view settings. So what can we do here? We've got access to be able to turn things on and off. So we can hide things um, and we can bring them back again. So we'll bring the ground back. Then we want to be able to do some stuff with time. We want to be able to control time by instructions. What a handy thing that would be in the real world. So I'm going to take you back to a time earlier in the year when it was a bit darker. And now we want to be able to search for an object and maybe even have a closer look. So all the time here, all I'm doing is just pasting in um, these uh, bits of code that I had previously. Someone call that cheating. I think it's a bit harsh. So again, we can navigate to an object, um, place it in the center of our field of view, and then zoom in for a closer look. And then of course, it's not always the case that uh, you can do stuff that's particularly useful. Um, there is a bit of space for just a bit of larking around. Okay, so um, having demonstrated my ability to copy and paste scripts around and, and interact with Stellarium, what comes next? We're in a perfect position now to close the loop. Um, so Mark's challenge wasn't to muck about with scripts, it was to actually create a guided tour of the ASE24. Uh, and that's exactly what we've been able to do. So by combining the techniques that we've seen already, we've been able to put together a, a, a visual movie-like annotated tour of the entire ASE24 observing list. So that sounds like a big buildup. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to watch the whole movie now, but in true Hollywood, no expense, almost no expense spared style, we've created a teaser trailer and I'm delighted to confirm that this trailer will get its premiere right here, right now. So our budget didn't stretch to a soundtrack and I'm not going to try to emulate Carl, Sir Patrick, Brian or the other Neil by narrating over it. So I'll just ask you to sit back and enjoy the visuals.
Well, hope you enjoyed that. However, you might well be thinking, so what? What, <laughs> what benefits will this bring and to whom? Well, as my wife will testify, the main benefit so far is that creating all of this has kept me out of mischief and out of our hair for a few weeks. However, this does have the potential to be an exciting part of the ASE's educational and outreach activities that we discussed earlier. As I said, we have the ASE 24 tour fully scripted and we can create a custom tour for any right outreach audience or occasion. So where does that leave us now? Well, first of all, the ASC 24 tour will be available to any members who'd like to try it out. It'd be get, great to get a show of hands to see who's interested in having a go. Um, also, it'd be good to find out if anyone is interested in getting involved in, in further work. We do have some more ideas to try out. We'd also like to hear any ideas or suggestions from the members for what we could try next. And also, as I mentioned earlier, other planetarium software is available. So we'd like to explore other options to see what else might be possible in terms of guided tours using whatever mechanism each application supports. Uh, this attempt is very much a, a first version. Well, actually it's the second version, but we won't say any more about that. Um, we're obviously keen to push the boundaries further. I know of at least two other planetarium software products which support this kind of approach in different ways. So there's clearly a lot more to explore. Um, and that means a few more weeks peace and quiet for Mrs. Martin and maybe that tricky second presenting slot in a couple of months for me. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you very much for listening. And just before I open the floor to questions, I'll ask you one first. So which Stellarium feature would Charles Piazzi Smythe have been particularly impressed with? Uh, removing the clouds. Boom. <laughs> gold star, gold star that, for, that for was Hugh. Obvious. That was obvious. Well, I was actually, say perfect seeing is the other one. Re removing the atmosphere. Yes. It, it would have saved him a trip to Tenerife, um, but then it would have taken away yeah. a huge part of our history. <laughs> oh, Neil, thank you. And that was a, a, an excellent tour and uh, really interesting. And the fact that you got away with using the term astrophotography without Mark jumping at you, I'm, I'm surprised. But anyway, <laughs> no, excellent. Do we have any questions? Uh, there's none on the, none on the chat line, but uh, I've got a question. Uh, thing. Is it, now, I, war uh, I warned you, no difficult ones. No, I'm not <laughs> going to ask you the one about the comments that you refused to answer. Uh, is it just simply a, a matter of downloading one script? <clears throat> well, actually, the, the scripting API the, and the package itself comes with a collection of scripts, so it helps to get you started. Um, and then after that, it's really just you know, over to your imagination. So I looked at several of the examples and, and figure out different ways of, of doing things. And <coughs> actually uh, in the scripts folder, you've got a list of a whole list of, uh, you've access to a whole list of scripts. So um, when we publish the scripts and how to use them, I'll kind of sh uh, signpost a couple of different ways of, of running the scripts in Stellarium. Very good. Neil, oh, um... Um... Can you get it to point a go-to telescope to a place? That's a good question. I don't see why not, because Stellarium does do telescope control. I'm just mm -hmm. not sure if that functionality is exposed via the, the API. It's a relatively simple API, but probably something oh. to easily check. There's, there's a bit of activity online in the various forums um, about using scripting. Uh, I, I, I use uh, Stellarium to control my Celestron telescope, and therefore, if that script was running, then it should be moving the scope to those. Yeah. One things. a little bit further advanced was on Android devices, like a tablet, you can actually control a telescope like the Skywatcher Wi-Fi. 
So assuming, of course, it runs the same scripts, you could hand somebody a virtual tour on a tablet, mm. point, click, go. Yeah, I think that, that could be pushing it a bit far. I think the uh, Sky Portal software that comes or that's companion with the Celestron telescopes allows you to create those those tours. And obviously, once you've got your scope right. aligned, um, mm -hmm. you can basically tell it to navigate around those. Mm -hmm. You might be running the tube into the tripod leg, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, the the, the oh, bit gosh. about switching the ground off is a bit dangerous, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, I think I uh, SEAL um, allows you to um, put a sort of observing uh, program together, I think. I've not done it. I've just mm. read about it. So, uh, so for somebody like me, whose images manifest themselves fairly easily, mm. <laughs> And I don't spend too long. I can I can I can use a script. People want to spend hours and hours looking at something just to get that extra bit of detail. Then clearly it has less use. Yeah. Which cards? The, the, the young the young Sean Wickstead would like to ask a question. By the way, Sean, very much. what are you going to uh, be when you grow up? Is that, that... <laughs> <laughs> a diplomat? Um, the um, uh, firstly, thank you. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. And um, uh, really, I had a question for, for uh, based around people who won't be used to your level of technical knowledge when it comes to coding, etc. Um, I mean, this video in itself is already a tutorial, um, not just for our members, but by effectively putting it up on YouTube. But I'm just wondering, could, could it be possible for us to help members by someone like you actually taking that that script and and sending it to members on request so they can simply input us rather than I, I know it's a bit lazy not going through the steps but if you're if you're a total beginner which i would be i'll be honest with you about writing scripts mm -hmm. then um you know being able to do it for the first time would i think encourage people you know a drop and use system would then encourage them to understand how to do it themselves because people won't want to continuously ask saying can you write me a script for this can you write me a script for that but it's really just kind of mm. getting them started and i think that would open up sort of a lot of options for people i just wondered whether that had been considered yeah so there's, there's two it's a great question first of all um there's two possibilities there so someone mentioned cart to seal um it integrates with a different application called deep sky astronomy um, and it will actually do a guided tour from an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I think the challenge there is it's a bit more difficult to install, but anyone who's got those products installed, they could go down the Excel route. Um, for the Stellarium scripts, the idea that I had was to basically allow someone to create an observing list in Excel, and we could convert it into a script automatically. So I'm looking at ideas of of how to do that. Um, and then anyone who wants to, the way I've set these scripts up, uh, if someone's got some objects they want to observe one after the other, I made it really easy to just modify one of the files and then it'll it'll create the tour for you. So two or three different ways of, of attack, attacking that problem. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that would be a game changer, Neil, because if nothing else, the ability that would have to help people navigate their way around the night sky, particularly if you're not lucky enough to be in a dark environment where it can often be quite hard in an urban environment to just visually pick things out with your eyes. I, I think that would be, I, I really think that would be something we should look into. The, these scripts will be on our website afterwards with instructions on how to, to use them as well. So you can just drop Neil's script straight into your copy of Stellarium and that will that will give you a tour of these AAC 24 objects if you want to do that. A full, a full tour, that was just the, the shortened version, but you can actually see the whole lot. Excellent. And the time to go for just, that? I was just going to make a quick comment on Carts to Seal. Um, what you can do, of course, you can download any list you can come up with that's got R and A and deck into a um, program called Topcat. And Topcat will, as we discussed the other day, will link with Carts to Seal through something called SAMP. And you can then get to the situation where you can just click on a line on in the table on top cat that will send it to carts to seal and your telescope will follow it on, onto the object. It's actually relatively simple. 
when it works. <laughs> if you want to demo oh, sometime. John, you had me there. <laughs> <laughs> when it works, well, of course, it won't do planets and it won't do the moon because um, Top Cat and things don't recognise none stellar objects, if you see what I mean, i.e. Like planets yep. and moons. Um, they just don't exist. Like the sun, do the sun doesn't exist either in most catalogues. As I said, I think there's plenty of other things that we can mm. explore to try and do do more with this. Uh, the starting point was very much the ASE 24 and yes. Stellarium, but I think there's plenty of uh, well, said, avenues that we can take this further. Well, I said the other day you can you can download anything that you can get into a CSV file or into a FITS FITS. Uh, a FITS data file rather than the FITS image file you're probably used to. Any of that, you could just sit there and click on every object in sight, whether it's a faint. It does have a nasty habit, of course, trying to see things through the earth, which is the other minor technicality because <laughs> you don't necessarily know where the horizon is. But there's something. That could be another demo I'll have to do. <laughs> Did we have any other questions, Peter? No, oh, the uh, the question box is uh, empty. I think you've wowed us so much that. Uh, oh, quite, Neil. Could I, could I just make a, a quick suggestion, Neil? Um, one possible idea would be uh, to create um, some observing lists that were seasonal, so you know, autumnal and summer and winter constellations and so on. Uh, you know, the sort of uh, the highlights of each of those seasons. Yeah, so, I like that, Nigel. Good to... idea. Yeah, a modern version of Turn Left at Orion. <laughs> exactly, yes. Okay, yes. Get, get on that, Neil. You've got till Monday, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, about... did, you, did you have a question? Just as, just as well, the weather's bad over the weekend. What about the lockdown files? Hi, Neil. Thanks, Andrew here. Um, that was very good, and I think it could be very useful for the likes of me, as someone who sees badly in the daytime and in the nighttime, um, who struggles to get a good view of the immune, even with a two times Barlow, um, it could be what I need. But I had thought that if you bought Cystellarium, it would come set up so that you could take the AAC list and just find the things you wanted. And therefore it would take you around whatever you wanted to go. There's something obviously I'm missing in the connection between the two. So yeah, that's an interesting question. I When I dove into the, the scripting side of things, I didn't really stop to figure out if there was a way to do what we've just done without scripting it sounds like i need to have a look and see if i could have saved myself a bit of trouble um so I, I will do that um and now that we've got this this idea of being able to basically create a guided tour um i'll look for lots of other options with some of the other products it would be good to have a go at the scripting if that's the way it works but well done thank you no thank you but but uh, Andrew, you can look up in Stellarium, you can look for any object and it'll go to it. And then if you want to look at another object, you just um, put that into the search yeah. box. Yeah, so in interactive searching, if you know yeah. what you want to, to go to, that's not a problem. You just type as you know, I chose the moon, uh -huh. um, but you can just as easily choose um, any of the objects that uh, we showed on the tour and many more besides just in the search box and yeah. it'll take you there. And then you can, it'll take you to a reasonable view and you can zoom in and out. So interactive stuff isn't a problem. Uh -huh. um, the, the reason that the guided tour is interesting is because you can write a web page and have a PDF of the, the observing list for beginners. And then you can say to someone, if you want to see this item by item um, in Stellarium, then download the scripts, follow the instructions, Hello and it'll take you through the guided tour. Now, you if we've got yeah. things like um, stands and stalls and so on, if we're doing public events or maybe even some of the other four steps events, the, the tele telescope help shop and stuff, yeah. we might have a selection of those on hand. And you know, Nigel's idea of the seasonal stuff is, is perfect. Mm -hmm. you know, we, if, if we've got a telescope help event um, in the autumn, then playing on a laptop beside one of the telescopes, here's our autumnal observing list sure, yeah. um, with a little guided tour that's just kind of playing uh, on, a, on a continuous play on the in the background. I can see the advantage of that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, I just I just had a comment about, about it as well that I, I quite appreciated the way it zooms out 
and shows you where you are and zooms back in again, mm. rather than just sort of slewing around. You don't really have much perspective on where you are. I thought that was quite effective. Shows you where to look for these things. Oh, thanks, thanks, Jono. That was that was all me. I'm going to take that one. That was all, that was, uh, <laughs> I don't know how it's done, but yeah, I, I'm impressed. I, I figured that yeah, a quick, a quick view and then a zoom in and out would. At first, it was pretty jerky, and I think the first version I sent to Mark was pretty jerky. I think he's still recovering from that. Um, so yeah. Um, thank you. I'm glad you appreciated that. Okay. Well, if you've no more immediate questions, we can uh, we can move on to John, and then at the end, if you've thought of any questions for Neil, <laughs> we can come back. I'm here here all week. You're assuming there's some spare time after I've finished. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I have I have the bell. <laughs> oh, we've got the mute facility as well, haven't you, Marquez? <laughs> Okay, yes. Thank you, Neil. Right. Right, that's Mark. That's Mark's copy. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's start again. So that's me, as it just says there, and I'm going to talk basically about my telescopes and a couple of other things of um, not necessarily associated with my telescopes because I'm probably not the best um, or most enthusiastic observer, can I say? Probably because I live in the entirely the wrong place. Could we have the next slide, Mark, please? Yeah, so that's our virtual meeting, which I thought was quite funny in the AAVSO. Had that the other day, so I pinched that, which I thought was quite, a, quite an interesting way of holding a meeting. <laughs> the laptop's gathering. Right, Mark, next one, please. <clears throat> right, so that's a Oh, yeah, okay. That's me. I used to be an engineer, worked for London Underground, which is, you know, that funny transport people place down in London. Doesn't transport people anymore. In fact, the M managing director was on YouTube yesterday telling people not to not to travel, which I thought was a good start. <laughs> I've been an amateur astronomer for years. Um, I live on the south edge of London, and it's normally light polluted, and it's cloud polluted at the moment as well. And I've got a Lots of lights and a poor horizon. It's entirely the place you don't want to observe from. Um, I'm interested in all sorts of things, mostly outside the solar system. Um, I'm also interested in citizen science. I've done quite a lot of work on the universe, of uh, the universe, actually classifying thousands of things. And I'm interested in the possibilities of actually finding stuff in the big data that's out there because there's so much data now available that there just aren't the people out there to actually um, analyze it. So I reckon there's quite a good opportunity for amateur astronomers to actually discover things out there. In fact, I'm looking, I'm close to having discovered two things. I'm just trying to actually finish the investigation at the moment on them, but I'll, I'll, maybe I'll talk about that another night. Now, as I've said before in the picture that's behind me somewhere, Sorry, that thing, oh, I don't know, over there somewhere, is noctilucent clouds. I like to look at those. I can just about see them from here when it's a good day. Um, I've actually managed to see five, tra two tranches of Venus and three of Mercury in my life, and, that, and image them, which was quite surprising. It was actually clear from the south of England just about for both tranches of Venus. And I've also walked from the solar system from the sun to Pluto. You know, we'll have to talk about some. If someone wants to know how you do that, I'll talk about it later on. And if I'm not doing that, I'm raising funds for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, which will be all right for the talk on Friday about celestial navigation. I'll try and remember to bring the lifeboat with me. Right, next one, please, Mark. Right, now Horse started this, didn't he? You had to talk about the biggest telescopes you've ever used, I believe is the, the thing we start with here. Well, the one in the background in the top picture is actually the Lovell telescope. I haven't actually used it. I've actually ridden on it while it's observing, which is the interesting phenomena. You can actually, when you get on it, you walk up the steps and if you stand there for too long, you get run over by the telescope. I'm never sure I've ever actually had that phenomena before. It actually, you can see it perceptively moving is the Earth rotates, or in fact, the telescope stationary, isn't it? The Earth's moving. Um, the one in the front there is the Mark II telescope at Jodrell Bank. 
I haven't sort of observed with it, but I did actually get Tim O'Brien from Jodrell Bank to actually take some observations. Um, I did a radio astronomy course with them back in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s. And I realized that the moon was going to occult the Crab, no Crab Nebula. And that, of course, was the way they used to find things like quasars, because it was very much easier to, or was that the only way possible way of finding an object like that was to see it disappear. Um, and see when the signal disappeared and you then got a curve and obviously the quasar or the object you were looking for would be on the um, edge of the moon at the time. So the largest telescope I've used is the, I think it's a 10 meter down on the bottom right there. Um, that's normally used for pulsar observations, but we used it for some other things when I was up there. So that's my large telescope page. Right, Mark, could you have the next one, please? Right. These are the telescopes I normally use. Um, of course, what I've lost here is all my notes, but I'll do it from memory anyway. Um, the, I've got a Celestron 8 GPS, which is a 200 millimeter on his, it shows on the left there. I, because of my poor observing conditions, I decided um, my telescopes had to be portable. It's no good having an observatory in my back garden because well, if you look, something would be behind the trees behind the houses or whatever else so my theory was pick it all up put it in the car take it off to the local dark site or whatever and observe things in fact obviously the bottom the left hand picture was nice and sunny because that was actually the transit of mercury i believe i took that during now the eight gps i don't know if other people have sort of got something similar but these schmidt crashy grains are wonderful telescopes for looking at very small things. And particularly if you've got a small chip camera, as I think someone mentioned the other day, the field of view is minute. So yes, look for small things on there, but don't expect to see anything very wide. Even with a, um, a DSLR on the back, I can't even get the whole of the sun or the moon in it. So, you know, that is a limitation if you like want to look for wide angle things. For wide angle thing, wider angle things, I use the um, Skywatcher 80 I've got on the right there. Um, that was actually during the um, lunar eclipse a while ago, um, end of 2019, or no, beginning of 2019. Um, take it to the bottom of my garden. The advantage is you can do that. You've got power from the garage, so you can actually have things like the um, monitor out there. Yeah, every, I'd actually need a dew heater for the monitor because the monitor was frosting up, which was an interesting challenge. And as you can see in the bottom picture, it probably I don't know how well it comes out in your in the video version, but the by the time I'd finished in the early hours of the morning, the entire scope was covered in frost. So <laughs> that's hardcore observing as far as I'm concerned, if you get frost all over the telescope. Surprisingly, it survived without dew heater on. So with a decent dew shield on the front, it's actually quite quite good for um, resisting dew. I will say the Celestron's absolutely abysmal with that big corrector plate on the front. If you don't have a dew heater on, um, first sign of coolish weather and dampish weather, you end up with um, frost all over it. So you definitely need a dew heater. Right, next one, please. Right. That's all I'm going to say about my telescopes. I, I will say the um, HEQ5 mount works very well, um, but um, it does sound horrible. If anyone's into precision engineering, that's one thing those mounts aren't. You can hear the gears rattle, but it doesn't seem to have that much effect on performance. The eight GPS is a, sounds a far better mount, but I have, have had problems because I've had to replace the handset and one of the things I don't know if people realize that if you replace the handset on these Celeste ones, you lose a lot of the um, automatic alignment facilities because there was a dispute between Celestron and Mead. They had to withdraw a lot of the semi-automated alignment and the modern versions don't have that. So that's why they went to the later versions that have got the camera built in. 
But here's a sort of little tip for people. So I thought I'd do something about tips for people. Um, if you get your manual for your telescope, I know the um, ED40 or ED80 manual says this, you know, you've got to find a scope on top. And what does it say? First thing it says, point your telescope at the local church tower. Uh, um, I haven't got a local church tower. In fact, I can't even see anything very far away. And then when you've actually found the church tower, which is a, um, a feat in itself quite often through the um, main eyepiece of the telescope, because obviously you've got a fairly small field of view, you then tweak the finder to it and it's then aligned. Problem is you've got to do that during the daylight as well. During the night, if you, you know, these well, we do actually get dark evenings down here in the south. I don't know if you know that things, but we do actually get dark evenings. You put the telescope out late-ish. You then have an interesting problem of range aligning the finder. I don't know how people do it. Other people do it, but trying to find a star in the main telescope, then find it in the finder so you can actually align the finder is a big challenge, I find. So I came up with this invention. Is it an invention? I suppose it's vague an invention. Um, what it does, and I've tried to actually photograph it, and I've never really succeeded, is the top left picture shows a adapter I made, which has got a green laser pointer in, um, with a hole drilled through the adapter. It doesn't actually show very well there, and I haven't got my pointer. Obviously, doesn't work. But there's a hole right the way through the adapter. And the black ring stops it going too far into the eyepiece. <clears throat> now, if you look at the top right picture, you can see the adapter in the place of the eyepiece. Admittedly, where it is at the moment there is quite difficult to um, look through the finder because you poke your eye out with the um, laser pointer. <laughs> so I told you, you know laser pointers are dangerous, don't you? Um, normally, of course, you'd actually have the finder or the um, I piece at an angle, but it was easy to photograph it lying flat like that. Um, if you look at this at night, what, what you see through the finder is an enormous great green beam disappearing into the distance. And all you have to do is to tweak the finder till that beam appears on the crosshairs in the middle of the finder and it's aligned. Dead easy. The only danger is, of course, is all these helicopters flying around. They tend to get sort of rather upset if you point at them. So you have to be very careful about when you do it and aircraft and find aircraft and helicopters being in the way. Um, it may look a bit wonky in the top left picture. And that was um, a happy accident. <laughs> um, I've only got a very little lathe in my garage. And in trying to drill this half inch hole for the laser pointer through the aluminium block, it all went a bit wonky or off center. After it happened, I realized that that was a very good idea because if you actually have it on the center axis, the laser light would go down to the secondary of the Schmidt Cassig grain, because this works on the Schmidt Cassig grain just as well. Um, it would go down to the secondary, be reflected straight back to the laser point, and you wouldn't actually emerge out the front. So it has to be enough of an angle to miss the secondaries or go off axis on the secondary, so it bounces off the primary and then goes out of the front of the laser. Um, it's also quite useful for the other thing I've used is public demonstrations. Is quite often you get to the stage where you pointed the telescope at something and someone says, "Well." Where's M13 on the sky? And you think, well, I'll get my laser pointer out and if I can work out where it is. Well, the quick one with this is you whip the eyepiece out, you put this in place of the eyepiece and coming out the front of the telescope like a Star Wars um, lightsaber, there's a line going straight up to M13. Dead easy. <laughs> so it's quite good for public outreach as well. So that's one thing that, one little tip for people. Right, next one, please, Mark. Right, this is my observatory. <laughs> um, as I said, I've got fairly large problems with visibility. Even to the north, it's not that good. And I've actually got my ca I actually mount my camera on the window frame. And that's what I norm that's what I use for pictures like the one behind me. So 
um, it has to be up high because there is actually a street lamp opposite that will appear in a lot of my Noctilus and cloud images. I use a cat. I use a camera with a wide angle. It's a it's an old Canon 10D, the first camera DSLR I bought. Um, I only use that because I take images every 30 seconds, and it hammers the shutter to death. And of course, the DSLRs only have a fairly limited life shutter life, particularly the 10Ds and even worse, the 600, the three digit. D series cameras have a very relatively short shutter life. So I thought, well, it doesn't really matter if I ruin the shutter on this camera, so that's what I use. And it's actually um, controlled by a Raspberry Pi, and it's got some software in it to keep Neil happy and Mark happy. It's running a Python program. Um, it's um, a bit knife and fault, and you can't actually, it's a wonderfully sophisticated if you want to change things you have to edit the code to do things like change the time between the images and things like that but the one thing it does do that you can't normally do with one of these off the shelf interval, interval boxes that you can buy is it does do a mirror lock up and of course that requires that you press effectively press the shutter button twice quickly you know once just to raise the mirror and once again before you take the image and I don't believe any of the off-the-shelf systems do that. So that, that works quite well. I save the images to the camera. Then, as I think I said the other night, I download them. It automatically downloads them when the sequence finishes to the Raspberry Pi. Because being that Canon 10D is, what, 15 years old now, processor in it is quite slow. So it takes an awful long while to download 200, 300 images. But it can do that quite happily while I'm asleep. So... By the time I get up in the morning, all the images are on the Raspberry Pi, and I can just copy them straight across to my network um, storage, which is fairly quick and easy. So, and then just check them in the morning. Right, so that's the next one. And we have the next slide, please, Mark. Now, something a bit different is. Um, I've got lots of, I've got two telescopes, I've got lots of camera lenses, I've got several cameras, DSLRs, various other things, as I've listed on the left-hand side there. And I always found out that whatever you do, it's a different assembly. And quite often I'll go out there, I used to go out there at night and think, well, I know I could put that camera on the back of that telescope and I know it focused somewhere, but how the heck, what did I do? And I, you know, I started making notes in a on pieces of paper and things. It all got very, very unmanageable. So what I ended up doing was actually just creating a big, effectively, what was at the time a Word document is now been moved to um, LibreOffice. But basically, it's an um, li a, a manual where I can put anything in that's useful um, when I set up the telescope again. I could, I've got images in there of how things are put together. I was going to show you a copy. I might be able to still make, might be able to show you a copy of it in a minute. But I've got data sheets in there. I've got um, pictures of how the various adapters go together. Um, it's been going on for ages. I'm on version 17 now. And it's had for a few subversions in the middle of that. So it's, quite, it's an evolving document. And it's very useful for, you know, for um, remembering things when you want to do something that you've done before, but may, you know, may have been six months ago, you may have forgotten. And if you've not got a permanent set up in your observatory, I find it a very useful thing to do. So I think there's another slide, is there, Mark? Right, so... I think if we end your screen there, and I'll just try and show you the copy of what I've got on my manual. Right, so if I go back and manage to share my screen. Would help if I hadn't closed it, wouldn't it? We 
just be a slight technical hitch. Well, you're doing that, John, I, I sympathise. <clears throat> it's more a function of age for me, but uh, having a uh, having a, a, a picture uh, and a checklist as I do with, with two, or do, two or three different telescopes to use, I found very useful. Do I need a focal reducer here or don't I? Yes. It's much better to do that and say, why is this image looking very small? Well, you, you can waste an awful lot of time. Why is... There it is. So you've actually got my telescope handbook, have you? Yep. Oh, right, OK. I'm now totally confused because the presentations appeared on the other screen. So this is the sort of thing, and, uh, you know, yours will not be at all like mine, but basically um, it's got a big advantage. I, I save it normally as a PDF so I can keep it on the laptop. Obviously, you can search it dead easily then because obviously PDF has got a fairly good search facility. Whether you keep it as a Word document or an open office format for document. But basically, I'll try not to scroll up and down it. So I've got things about my Celestial Note GPS. I've got things about my Skywatcher. I've got how you mount different cameras on it. I also got things saying how the heck, how I mount my camera cameras and their lenses sometimes on my HEQ5 mount is a way of tracking things and so I've got things that do that and down the bottom I've got things about telling me how my battery pack works or how it should what voltage it should have and various things on um, some some filters and various things like that so you know it's all fairly um basic you know that my, I modified my Celestron 8 GPS to have a Bluetooth connection, which wasn't tremendously successful. But it does tell me there how I sh should be able to connect to it. But unfortunately, the protocol with a Bluetooth connection has got no error connect correction on it. So if you get a dropout, the like, GPS throws a wobbler and the whole thing has to be reset. So it didn't actually work very well. So I don't actually use it, but it was an, it was an experiment. So I've got things like there tells me useful things like what the back focus of the um, Celestron should be. Uh, one thing people don't realise with these Schmidt Cassie grains is that the back focus is actually fairly critical. It's actually designed to be at a focal point of, I believe, five inches, at least for the Celestron ones. And you ha you've got a tolerance of under half a millimeter from that correct position if you want the best performance from the optics on the telescope. So while it's got that wonderful focusing knob on the back, they enable you to move the mirror inches backwards and forwards. The performance of the telescope optics falls quite rapidly. So I've got lists there, you know, what extension leads I've got. I won't go through all of this, but that's a sort of, you know, that's a sort of picture showing there that um, how you mount things. It's got the Canon mount on the left-hand side and the right-hand side has got the um, adapter that screws on the back of the telescope. <clears throat> to get the correct 72 millimeters to five inch equivalent distance, allowing for the Canon focal plane to adapt to length, I had to actually make up that aluminium washer that you can see in the bottom because I couldn't actually find one online that actually is the right thickness. Um, but that was an attempt to actually get the um, focal distance correct. I won't go through the rest of this, but if anyone, uh, I say, it's obviously a thing that's um, very personal. One thing that is on this picture that you can see at the moment with showing the um, adapter sequences is I added a focus scale on the um, Skywatcher ATED because one thing it hasn't got is a scale on it. And I find it quite useful that if you've got one of these cameras that's got a very small field of view, um, like a webcam or something, it's very useful to get the focus position approximately right to start with. 
And one of the things I've got recorded in here is what the number on this scale I've added to the, I don't know if my pointer shows up, but I've added a scale on top of the drawer tube. There was a big enough gap between the drawer tube and the casting to actually just put a stick on scale on. And it's quite useful that you can therefore reproduce where you where you um had it focusing last time. And you know, it's there within a couple of millimeters and you just need to tweak it rather than actually spend your time winding backwards and forwards trying to actually find out where the correct focus position is. So I think that's all I want to say. If there's any questions. Well, thank you, John. That was, uh, we, we all approach these things differently and it's really interesting to see you know, how, how different people do it. Um, I must say, my, um, my checklist is, is, is exactly what it is and a much simpler one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I might it from, from a more sophisticated one. My, my checklists are bits of masking tape wrapped around tubes and um, mounts and dovetail bars at various points to show which <laughs> balance. <laughs> yeah, well, that's yes, yeah, okay, yes, you can do that. Or you could you could bear the scale, of course, and then um, write it down. But I say it's a, it's horses for courses. You know what works what works for you and what doesn't. Yeah. If if you have, I, I have, one a of the modern, you have one of the modern electronic focuses. They have in the software you can set various um, points for different cameras and so on. So yes. to say, go to that point for this camera. It's quite easy. Yes, yes. But of course, if you've got several, well, it depends on. I've got two telescopes, as I said, and there's all sorts of things that I've got on there. Is um, so I, some, I sometimes use the. I've tried using the ATED on top of a photographic telis, photographic tripod. That's a bit of a challenge. You can just about balance it, but it's not particularly, it's surprisingly how the lack of rigidity, even the expensive photographic tripod there is, if you've got a seven, 800 millimeter lens equivalent, and it's fairly. Any questions for John then? I was just going to say, John, uh, I have a Celestron uh, CPC-8, yep. which is uh, similar to yours. And I've got a Hyperstar on the front which enables yes. me to change it from F10 to F2. So you can get much wider field of view. Yes, yeah, mine, mine should do as well, but I'm not sure you can still, because mine's quite old, I'm not sure you can still buy the adapter. All right. Well, I have um, uh, an eight inch bead and I use a, a 6.7 um, focal, focal reducer. Yes, so, uh, yes. It helps. Well, I think that's what people actually end up doing because I think this um, eight inch F10 started because people were imaging very small galaxies with small cameras. That seemed to be the in thing about what, 10 years ago? And then I think they ended up going to planetary imaging because of the size that they'd have actually got. And then they put about three Barlows on the back to get F30 or something stupid I've seen. I think the likes of Damien Peach use F30 or something stupid. I'm, Sure, some light comes out the other end of it, but um, no, the F2 actually performs very well. But I have actually heard people say that it's incredibly difficult to actually get good image quality across the entire focal plane with a, the DSLR on the back. Oh, well, I, I well, yeah, but the thing is, if you put that on, you can't have a DSLR on the back, so no, well, sorry, a DSLR on the front, on the front or, yeah. or something similar, you know, something with a large chip. Yeah. But of course you do lose quite a lot of light because of the size of the camera on the front. Yeah, well I I, I have a, a you know a, a, one of the attic cir circular ones. Yes, yes. So that uh enables most of the light still to get through. Mm. Yes, yeah, so the thing I was thinking that perhaps we ought to as well as having telescopes, perhaps we ought to have a thing on mounts and mount alignment. Yeah, I mean these uh, these talks uh, we call them scope talks, but mm. I, mean, I think any piece of uh, uh, helpful um, either software or hardware uh, somebody thinks is worthy of uh, extolling the virtues of, then feel free. Um, it could be filters um, or autofocuses or any of the other gizmos. That, yes, things that keep you warm. <laughs> <laughs> Scotland, when you're uh, I'm I'm surprised you're complaining, John. That uh, you're I'm a soft southerner. Down in London, I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't put the dew shield on until oh, February. 
Well, that was January, of course, but I, I actually had a fan heater on in the garage, and that's right outside my <laughs> garage. So um, I retreated to the garage occasion in the hot flask of coffee. <laughs> if there's no frost on the telescope, you're not doing it right. No. Is that on the front on the front plate of the corrector plate, is it? This is the man who sits in his observatory, uh, John. Yes. <laughs> the man who sits in his house controlling his observatory. Mm. He wants a script to help him. <laughs> okay, any, any, any more? Any more? Well, thank you, John. Um, we'll show our appreciation in a normal way. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, I think, Mark, we said we'd, we'd try and get the, um, the quiz for anybody who missed it. Who, uh, who wants to see it will try and put it up on the members website <coughs> suitably modified and corrected <laughs> after the comments of uh, last Friday but, uh, it was a good laugh I enjoyed mm. that um, and uh, hopefully we'll, um, we'll probably see you next Wednesday unless you've got anything else you want to uh, talk about Mark uh, well Wednesday will be great I think we've got Hannah, Hannah Wakeford from, from uh, Bristol uh, planet atmospheres I think we were lucky to it was just a sort of a a throwaway comment on, on um, Twitter. I saw she was um, chatting on there. So I said, so you wouldn't like to do a, a chat for us as a society, would you? She said, yeah. So I think we're very lucky to get her, actually. It should be mm. really good. So if, you, if you've ever, I don't know if any of you have ever heard the Exocast podcast. It's all about exoplanets. It's quite fun, actually. They have fun stuff on there as well. There's lots of really useful stuff. She's one of the hosts on that. So I think it'll be a really good talk. So definitely one not to miss that one, I think. Excellent. I, I, and, and, and I thought we'd cast our net wide. I've written to NASA, to uh, Sarah Frazier, who uh, publishes the uh, um, Parker Solar Probe information mm. on the NASA website and said, any chance of a talk? Why not? Um, we'll just see, yeah, we'll just see what comes. That, uh, the only problem is the time difference quite often, of course. Well, it's good for them. It's, it's fine for them. It's in lunchtime for her. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to, uh, to, to Neil and thank you to John. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.